Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the Future in Review podcast. I'm Barrett Anderson, the COO of Future in Review. And for those of us, those of you who have never heard of Future in Review before, we run the annual FIRE conference, which The Economist has called the best technology conference in the world. The other arm of our business, Strategic News Service, provides its subscribers with the most accurate source of information about the future of technology and the global economy. If you enjoy these updates, you should definitely sign up for a free trial of the Strategic News Service Global Report using the link below. And I'm here today with Evan Anderson. We are going to be talking about his new book, Disengagement. Uh, Evan is the CEO of Invent IP, which is our initiative focused on fighting nation-sponsored intellectual property theft. And he has just come out with a book. So Evan, tell us a little bit about uh, about this this new book of yours. I know you've been working on this for a long time and it's been something we've talked about in successions in some of these podcasts as you've explored different aspects of it in, in the global report. But I'm curious, you know, the US is so intertwined with the Chinese economy. Why do you think disengagement from China is actually possible? It's a very yeah. optimistic <laughs> in some ways. Yeah, I think that a lot of folks have made um, various arguments and, and, you know, people often call it decoupling. I'm arguing for in my in my work for disengagement, which I just think of as broader and more strategic. Um, but there's a lot of different folks making arguments about how we cannot decouple. Um, and in some circumstance, that was just said by somebody from Raytheon um, just a week ago. And in that case, it's sort of silly because you, you really rather quite need to decouple your supply chain if you're a major. U.S. military supplier. I'm working with the DoD all the time, um, but there are you know tech companies and banks and um, folks in all sorts of fields that say that it's too hard or too too complex or we can do it some of the way but not all of the way. And essentially, what I'm what I'm saying here is uh, not only can you um, but you must. And the reason that you can is that uh, we're not on a specific time schedule. So if someone were to say you need to remove you know, all reliance on, uh, you know, supply chain aspects that are under CCP control by Monday, then it would be extremely impossible, right? It would be not only extremely difficult, but impossible. Um, and I think a lot of the time when people are talking about the difficulty or the complexity of this process, uh, the question in their minds is, you know, how long are we talking about? It? And they're often thinking about within the next year or so. Essentially, my argument is different, which is that, um, and we'll get into this a little bit more, but, um, there is not only a moral, but uh, uh, self-defense essentially imperative to doing so. And so if we know we must, and we do, I believe, know we must, I explain a lot of that in the book, uh, then the question is just how long will it take and how difficult will it be? And so I would be okay, the last but, but, to but say- Let's back up just a bit, mm -hmm. because I think you just kind of skipped over a really important core point of this. Yes. Why must we? Why? Um, yeah. There's a couple major reasons, but uh, I think I'd start by going back out to kind of a broader level. And I'm going to make a statement here, which is the CCP specifically in China is the greatest that threat to human health and survival that we know today. And I think probably any listener right now is thinking, hold on, let me think about different things I know threaten you know, the human species and the planet. Well, what about climate change? And we can get deeper into this, but Again, the CCP is the biggest threat when it comes to climate change that we know today. Um, and so there's a lot of different ways that, that, you know, the book covers many, many, many different aspects of this. But that statement, I believe, is very true. And therefore, we do not have a choice, right? It's not about hemming and hawing and figuring out whether we can kind of do business with the CCP or not. Um, the real problem, and they're building more coal plants and they're accelerating right now. Their, their rate of construction of new coal plants and new starts on coal plants. In this world, in this day and age, they are accelerating the number that they're building and they're building more than the rest of the world combined. They're building two a week now. So, um, so some would argue, I hear what you're saying about human health from a climate perspective. Um, I think it's clear that perhaps some of their security procedures at their national labs have been an issue for a few of us in the world in the last couple of years. Maybe one or two. Uh, you may know someone who's been affected. Yeah, but let's, I'm, I'm... <laughs> let's, well, hold on. Let's not skip over that. So um, we've talked about the biggest thing that I can think of that threatens human survival, and that's climate change. You're referencing mm -hmm. the pandemic. 
Um, mm-hmm. I actually argue in the book, there's still an ongoing debate about origins. Perhaps there always will be, perhaps not. I'm actually inclined to believe that there will not. Um, I think it will be settled, but it doesn't actually matter because even if this recent COVID pandemic did not come from, you know, the, the oh, wow. in Wuhan, the, the reaction of the CCP to the outbreak was bad enough to threaten the world. And so rather than trying to tackle a novel outbreak of a new pathogen immediately and with complete transparency and asking for all the help that they could possibly get, they instead tried to cover up various aspects of it. I think we all probably still remember the number of folks that were whistleblowing in Wuhan. Good people, mm-hmm. right? That were trying who to tell the world who disappeared. Um, and and that's not even the worst of it, right? So um, no matter what you think about what the origins may be, you still have a government that was hoarding medical supplies, then tried to sell them back, developed a vaccine that wasn't effective, lied about its efficacy, used it for diplomatic uh, leverage around the world, uh, kind of trying to obscure the fact that it wasn't a very good vaccine. These things threaten billions of people's lives. So on the pandemic front, we also had a strong reminder that the CCP really should not be partnered with. And anything that comes, you know, down to basic health, Global health. You, right. you cannot, tra- you know, their, their role in the WHO is suspect. Their general behavior is not protective of human health. And we shouldn't be particularly surprised because these are folks that are currently committing genocide, which we also know all about. So this isn't okay, really so, rocket science. <laughs> right. So, okay. So, so you've got me on, on, on the why they're a threat to human health. But my my question then is not if that is true. I think there's plenty of evidence to suggest that. My question is, you know, when you think about how to change the behavior of a country and how to affect the behavior of a country, a lot of people would argue that it helps to have some kind of buy-in to that country in order to change their behavior. So I'm, Indeed, my yeah. question is, why disengage when you're, what you're trying, what is your thinking on that tension yeah. between pulling out and losing all kind of influence and uh, trying to shift things from, with what leverage we have based on right. our economic and I think that goes back to an underlying problem with the, the general philosophy that the world has applied to a rising China run by the CCP. So um, if, you, if you rewind uh, about 30 years, but really more longer, um, the entire idea all the way back really to Nixon um, in 72, opening up relations with China and Kissinger's entire philosophy that that would therefore give us more leverage with the CCP. Uh, that idea has not worked very well. And I'm not sure you know, how many people are left that are still sitting around saying, oh, engagement is what we need because you know, that'll, that'll really give us leverage, but there are quite, we, a, there are quite a few. There, yeah. there seem to be ever, you know, ever fewer, but yet I still hear it. And I think that that's a failed policy. And I think a lot of people understand that it's a failed policy, but for those who don't, um, I would just challenge them to name a time in the last 30 years that the CCP has slowed down its rate of trying to threaten or become more aggressive, um, uh, the countries around it, right? So have they become less aggressive? Have they become more cooperative? Not really. Um, the opposite, in fact, has been true. And so in that vein, the more that you engage, particularly on a, on a business level, the more that you help to fuel that economy. And if that economy is being run by a government that uses its revenue from, from taxation, et cetera, to then threaten the rest of the world, you should probably stop putting money into the system. Right. And so I, I actually am arguing that that not only is that concept of engagement being um, a beneficial something that offers you leverage geopolitically is is wrong. I'm saying the opposite is actually true specifically when it comes to China right now under this government. Right. And so um, if if so it's, it's, it, you might liken it to a fire. Right. What I'm hearing from you is like the more oxygen get, that the fire gets. China is the fire. And yeah. the more oxygen that you're throwing on the fire, the bigger the bigger it gets, the stronger it gets. Yeah, that's one way to look at it. Um, I think another way to look at it that's very direct and not an analogy or anything is the only times that we have immediately been able to get an easy meeting with the Chinese government as it exists in this form is when we have stopped doing something that was greatly benefiting them. 
And so if you really want to talk to them about their behavior in the CCP, the way to do it is not by continuously giving them what they want ahead of time just to get the meeting that then goes nowhere. The way to do it is to stop fueling the fire, to your point, and then see what they reevaluate afterwards. And so the first right. step is necessary to actually get anywhere. In fact, there's a really, really kind of long and uh, at this point, a little bit boring and, and exhausting history of Western entities, but also just many countries that deal with China making concessions before they even meet. And the Chinese are very adept diplomatically. The CCP very, is very adept diplomatically at making that seem like the way to get a meeting is to make concessions ahead of the meeting. And that I think is just really, really dangerous when you look at what, A, what they are doing, what the CCP is doing around the world, whether it's you know t threatening territorial sovereignty, overfishing the world's oceans, et cetera. Um, you can't be at a place still 30 years later where you're giving up anything that you have as leverage in order to secure a meeting. That's just ill-advised. You need to be way beyond that. <laughs> so a lot of the, com the conversation that we're having right now is kind of focused on a nation state level, right? Like what, do you, like what are the federal policies that someone could pursue in order to elicit a different kind of reaction from China? And how possibly convince them to change their behavior in some way. Who do you imagine would most benefit from reading your book? Is it policymakers, global policymakers? Is it business people? Like if I'm watching this podcast, how do I know if I should think about if I need to read disengagement? Yeah, I would say all of the above. It's it's aimed at decision makers. Um, the the reason that I that I wrote it is that I think it helps to have a distilled perspective on the many reasons why this is not an option, right? Why continued engagement will not work because we, we surely know that there are many people who still hope to make money. And this is also a longstanding story, hope to make money in the Chinese economy that are from outside of that country. And so they will do whatever the CCP says in order to try to make a dollar. And they are regularly, as we mentioned, they are still on the radio and on TV and in media talking about the importance of engagement. And so the, the real target audience here is all of us, but particularly if you are a decision maker in a company or in government, um, I am talking to you and I'm talking to you about the reasons that we need to stop those failed policies of the past, stop those failed corporate policies of the past where we work in China, even though they steal IP, even though they you know, use your factory and run it at night and then sell your counterfeit, but, but technically your product uh, out of a company, all these different things that we've talked about for years, um, kind of boiled down to a more strategic problem, which is you must disengage. Here's how we can do it. Um, you mentioned, you know, at an at a individual nation state level. And, and actually, one of the things that's important to mention here is no one can go it alone. And so I'm strongly advocating that a group of nations do this. I've been very encouraged by the progress we've made there. There's a lot more to do. So I'm also talking to governments around the world, not simply my own. Um, are there, when you think about the immediate next steps or the Im immediate first steps that you would like to see taken, what would be the low hanging fruit? And I'll ask this from two, per two angles or two perspectives. One, if I'm a company leader, what is the first thing I should tackle? And number two, if I am a leader in government in some way, if I work in government, what is the thing that I should be most concerned about? And that's a broad question, but maybe- no, we can it's, a, it's a really good question actually. And so um, I've actually been answering that question for some time and, um, and so of others. And so for the same reason, there's more progress on, on what would be my first wish list items than by far than there was just a few years ago. Um, so that's very encouraging. I think the broad spectrum way to describe it would be the most important and cutting edge things are, are, should be everyone's top priority. And I think that's becoming uh, more and more obvious. So whether you're a, a company in you know, Japan, the US, uh, Europe, you should not be manufacturing your, your most important IP inputted items, your, your uh, top crown jewel items in a country that's going to rip you off because you're just giving away the whole show, right? Um, and the same goes for governments. And governments and companies can work together. What's what the most important thing that any national government or international government 
um, body, governance body has as a role here is to provide air cover for people who otherwise may not be able to justify pulling out. And that's happening a lot more too. So um, that's the first thing. Uh, we've all seen many items in the news cycle over the past few years that uh, lead us to believe that that's going uh, okay, but we need to do a lot more. I think it's a little bit remarkable that even in the United States, we're still cutting companies out of, you know, putting companies on the entity list, for instance, that are directly involved in the genocide in Xinjiang. That's, we're late to the game. Um, but there's a lot of progress being made and a lot of great people working on it. And from there, you can start working down. So the next tier, I would say, is your entire manufacturing base has just moved to a country. The global manufacturing base, right, no matter who you are, has moved to a country with probably relatively ill intent. That's a bad thing. And if they decide to do something to any of their neighboring countries, not just Taiwan, they threaten most of their neighbors um, or to the U.S. or to Europe. Um, they're very aggressive with European entities, uh, whether they be companies or governments that speak out against any action that the CCP has taken. So if they're going to cut you off, you need to be able to respond to that. And that's part, again, part of the, um, the why as well, right? This is not a sustainable level of concentration of power. And you need to be able to source industrial goods from elsewhere. So if you start with high tech, and then you move to ma major key aspects of manufacturing, we've talked a lot about, you know, critical uh, metals. We were just talking about Taiwan um, as, a, as a geopolitical hotspot a couple of weeks ago, and, and the fact that the world relies on China for a lot of its steel and aluminum and what a threat that is. So those things should come next. You shouldn't have all of your manufacturing base concentrated in a country that does not necessarily have good intent towards most of you as nations, right? Right. It's a collective issue. So I have one final question for you. And it has to do with a recent event, but I'm curious, over the weekend, we saw an attempted coup in Russia. It was a wild weekend, yeah. Still not quite clear to me what, what the real outcome of that is. Um, we may be seeing, if, I would say we may be seeing after effects of, of that uh, for quite some time. I think it, right. the, the thing itself was a symptom and you know, right. there's a lot of folks that are doing analysis. There may be, on. yeah, and you, which, is what I'm, which is what I'm trying to ask you about. I think there may be future attempts that, you know, it's, it's really exposed a lot of Putin's weakness, blah, blah, blah. But so my question blah, is, blah. <laughs> et cetera, et cetera. Et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so my question is, let's say there's a successful coup attempt. How does that affect China's in your opinion, this clearly no one, none of us know the real answer to this, but how does that affect China's stance toward the rest of the world? Because I think, China, at the moment, Russia and China are very closely allied and they're working together quite closely. D does that change? And does that weaken China's either stance or It would ability? certainly weaken yeah, it would certainly weaken their position internationally. So right now, um, unfortunately for uh, Russia's you know, desire to kind of enter a new era of uh, uh, re-entering imperial power status, global power status, what we've seen, of course, over the past year has been the opposite. Um, their power has actually decreased internationally uh, quite a bit. Um, and while sanctions have mixed results, they are certainly harming Russia's economy. Um, their ability to do a number of things is greatly reduced. The benefit from China that is most obvious is that Russia becomes more like a vassal state to China. Um, the use mm. of Russia to China less and less will be that it is a, a uh, partner as a great power, I think, and more and more will be it is a source of resources. Um, you know, it's got vast tracts. Yeah, of station. <laughs> yeah, a, a, a gas station um, and, and a station for many other basic resources that China needs. Russia will have lower negotiating power by far now that they have decided to you know, continue this invasion to the point where they're drastically weakened on the international stage. Um, and I think the, the real problem for China in the, in the circumstance or the contingency in which Russia becomes more and more like a failed state would be uh, Russia serves much like North Korea as a, an excellent foil right now for China. And so as partners, Russia can meddle with Western entities and China can stand back and either uh, assist or 
you know, watch or learn, um, but they don't have to be the ones that are doing the thing. Um, and so right now, that's a good thing if you're the CCP. That is a, a nice partner to have. Uh, much like North Korea, the Russians are constantly meddling with the West. Um, you know, we've all talked a lot about various, uh, on this podcast particularly, about various ways in which the Russian government has um, kind of infiltrated the Western information sphere uh, and poisoned the well in, the, in many ways and, cre you know, created, probably created almost from thin air entire political factions that didn't exist or at least strengthened them, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, right? It goes on and on and on. Um, to lose that would be, I think, a loss for China. And so I think at this point, they probably do not think of Russia as uh, a very reliable or um, particularly robust partner, but still as a useful one. And they probably would be sad to see that fall apart. All right. Well, so Evan, if someone wants to buy your book, it is on Amazon. So search for we'll disengagement put, on Amazon. It is on Amazon. We'll put a link in this. I'll put the link below. Um, and we hope that you all read it. And please do, uh, please do read it. Of course, we are grateful for any eyeballs and any support that we uh, get in this kind of broader international mission that we have. We tend to take on big projects here, and this is one of them. Um, and and give them to any decision makers you know who are constantly <laughs> these issues because we want them to be on the same page and to understand the urgency. All right, this is a, a secret whisper campaign to get <laughs> to get disengagement into the hands of global decision makers, and you are our allies. Indeed, and we need you. We need we need your support. All right, thank you, Evan. Fantastic Thank talking you. to you as usual. And we'll see you again on a future episode. See you soon. Future in Review podcast.